This was a uh, five-year-old dash home. When we started working on this dog, he had a broken back. Um, he had no bowel, no bladder, no tail, no hind legs, no feeling beyond the back, middle of the back. And the vet wanted to do a uh, $2,500 operation. Successful, of course. But um, the owner had balked at that. And he brought him over and he started stinging him. Um, he had um, four stings the first day, six stings the next day, eight stings two days later. Well, a week and a half with 44 stings of this dog, he got his bottom bladder back. So he kept on going. And uh, uh, we'd be putting 16 stings down that dog's back, and he'd do some squirming, you know. What's wrong with feeling a little bit of pain when you couldn't feel anything? Uh, now, the point is, we finally did lose that dog here in October. Uh, he only lived five years and a month after they wanted to put him down. And he was five years old when they wanted to put him down. Now, the point is, that dog had more than 100% lifetime with the girls picking on him. And uh, it wasn't just loafing. I mean, he, he only fathered 16 puppies during the last two years of his life. So he wasn't sitting around on his laurels or anything like that. Uh, he had a pretty active life. Uh, but the point is, <coughs> if you do that with a, a dog, think what you can do with a human. Uh, Happy therapy is nothing but quality of life. And either you want to have some quality of life or you don't care. And there's a lot of choices to be made with this. Um, and they're not easy choices either. Uh, these, these beast things are painful. No one's kidding anybody. They really are painful. Um, when that dog went, he went within less than a week's time, I'd say maybe three or four days. He had congestive heart, and he went very fast. Uh, but what's wrong with being out there living it to the max until the end? And we can do the same thing too, if we so choose. It's our choice. Um, but but a lot of people just don't want that kind of help, that kind of stamina. Um, and these are choices that we all have to make. Um, we work with another dog too, well, the lots of them actually. Um, we had one here just recently. your imagination on this one here. Um, this, was a, this was an Amish gal and uh, they're not open to pictures, they're not open to hardly anything. And um, 
But I, I realized since I've been down here that I really screwed up. I couldn't take a picture of these two little girls. I'd love to have had that. Uh, they were one year old, three year old, when I started working with them. They both had Down syndrome. And they used to just live in the hospital. I mean, they'd come home from being there a month and turn around and go right back. And uh, the mother was getting a little tired of this program and uh, was more than open to doing something different. And originally, uh, she wanted a product that I had, and that's how she got a hold of me. And then from there, it just went to these two little girls. And uh, the, the one-year-old, uh, they both had massive lung issues, massive lung issues. Uh, they, they did not have the physical strength to clear this shit off their lungs. They just could not do it. They had suction devices and everything else, you know, and even with this, they couldn't get the job done. So, we finally started giving these little girls micro stings in the low half of the lungs. And we would put 15 micro stings in each little lung with uh, one B. And it wasn't no time before mother graduated them to full stings and started cranking it up a little bit. What's a micro sting? Yeah. Where do you put it? What do you mean by on the lower lung? On their body or on the back or swallow it? Or Lungs are a great big area. And a micro sting is a what? We take a bee and pull the stinger out of it and use a very delicate pair of tweezers and do little bitty micro stings. <laughs> and it, it will feel like you are, like someone's grabbing a hold of a hair on your arm and just lifting it. It feels like there's something tugging on your skin. You don't feel any pain or anything, but you do feel this tugging. Um, and this is what we started started out with. But like I said, it wasn't no time when mommy graduated to full stings. And we were tracking what we were doing. And she went from one to two, three, and four. Uh, and, and mommy was perfectly happy with what was happening with these little girls. And I loved to be around them when this was going on because it was really fun to watch these little girls try to get a hold of the biggest breath of air that they get in these lungs and let her fly. <laughs> I mean, when we are, they are now up to 12, 12 stings in the lungs, and some of them are branching out into other areas. Well, we're doing that deliberately. Um, these little girls got, um, both of them got shunts. Both of them got a feeding tube in the stomach. Uh, they wanted tricks in both of them. Mommy would not cave in. Uh, you know, just within the last two weeks, I was down there and working with the mother, and she was dealing with fevers with this one little girl, a three-year-old. And she was in bed, and she didn't have nothing on except a diaper. And I got to see that little girl's body. I mean, I was just totally blown away by all the scar tissue that this little three-year-old had from medical procedures on the legs, low legs, upper legs, arms, upper and lower arms, stomach. Uh, she, she was just loaded with scars. And I, I told the mother, I said, you know, sooner or later you're going to have to work with these things. She says, I know. Uh, she had a couple of scars down here in the 
area right in here where uh, they'd gone in, uh, put this tube in for the shunts, and it gave these little girls such so much problem that the mother had started stinging that scar, and we're putting two and three stings in each scar. Uh, there's nothing that can break up scar tissue like bee venom, but she could tell that these little girls, that these scars were giving these little girls a lot of pain. So, but I realized since I've been down here, I really blew it. I should have gone upstairs in this second story of this house and taken a picture of the two-story beehive that's up there in a spare bedroom <laughs> with an entrance going out through the window. And I, I apologize for that. I should have got a picture of that. And even though it's up there on the second floor, we got two inches of styrofoam insulation on all four sides and, and two inches on the top of it. And uh, it, was, it was a swarm on one of my observation hives. It was it come out at about two pounds. And it was home for about a week or so, and I took it down there for them to have bees to sting with. Um, but you know, they have done so well that uh, uh, I think that it's going to be uh, come through the winter very fine. Uh, you know, one of the problems with apitherapy is we need a lot of bees. And this is a, about a seven foot catalpa tree that I brought home on October 27th. Uh, it was all a backhoe wanted to do to lift up, get it off the ground hard enough. It, it couldn't even move with the thing, it was that heavy. And then I backed my pickup truck underneath of it. I got a one ton pickup truck and I backed it underneath it there and uh, put up the tailgate and drove off with it, brought it home. And we put a um, wire reel, you know, one of these big round wooden reels. We put half of that on the bottom of it, screwed it up, and stood it up. And, uh, but I'm gonna have to take off this, uh, this uh, piece of wood. Come on. It's supposed to work. There we are, I see it. Piece right up here. I haven't had time to get in there and take that off and see whether we end up with nothing but a bunch of wax and a little bit of honey or whether there's some girls in there yet. Uh, this is uh, Bronson. He's the dog that, uh, this is a day before he died. Um, we got a few pictures up there at the end. This one here is a um, kind of a Heinz 57, but the lady just loved him, you know. And he, uh, uh, they turned him out to do his duty, you know, and he took after, off after a cat, you know. And when he got to the end of his leash, his head stopped, and then the rest of his body kept on going. He got severe whiplash. And uh, they took him to a vet in Ashland, and the vet in Ashland sent him to a vet in Akron, Ohio. And the vet in Akron wanted to do a $6,500 operation. But in the meantime, uh, Bronson's owner, owner had gotten a hold of this gal and told her to give us a call. So the next day, she had that dog up there and we planted three stings in its back. And the next day we put six stings in its back. And two days later we put 10 stings in its back. And at that point they got it back to the vet in Ashland. And the vet in Ashland was so impressed that he had his wife up there that night to get stung. <laughs> <laughs> but let me tell you, <laughs> amphitherapy is no more powerful, uh, uh, 
friendly with the veterinarians than what it is with your medical people. I mean, we're right up there beside their favorite cuss word. Uh, that dog comes in now once a week and he gets about a, maybe 16 to 20 stings in his back and his hip. And his owner, her owner, is just a uh, tickled pink about his, his progress. This is a gentleman here that um, had cancer of the, of the tongue. And uh, he had three doctors lean on him hard to get a biopsy, and he listened to them and asked them questions. And he says, No, I'm not going to do that. One of the doctors went so far as to say it would never get better and uh, it would never change. Uh, even that doctor has pulled in his horns and said, you know, it's looking better. He said, even the ulceration is looking better. Now, like I said before, this stuff is about nothing but quality of life. This guy here only rolled over 82 on February 20th of this year. Now that's not too doggone shabby. Compared to what they wanted to do, this is a picture of him here. Uh, so where, where are you singing him? Not in the tongue, is it? Or is it? I certainly did. The girl, I did. The girls did. Yep. Okay. We don't beat around the bush with the girls. We let them get to the get to the good stuff. Now, it's probably been about four and a half years since I stung, started stinging his tongue. Now uh, we're we're not stinging up on the top of it. We're stinging on the side and down underneath on the left side. During the first three years, I used about 1,550 stings. That's a little over 500 a year. But we was working on other things on him, too. Uh, example, chainsaw cut in the, above the knee. Uh, he also had a, a broken ankle. He went out to get the mail and, and slipped and broke his ankle. But you know, he come in there. And we started to sting it, and it was doing fine, except he got a little too aggressive on what he was doing, and his family made him go to the doctor, take x-rays and everything else, and they find out he had a broken ankle, but mm -hmm. it was already healing, and it didn't have nothing on it. So all they did is give him one of them Vel Velcro boots, and we just kept on stinging it. Uh, you know, it, it's whatever you want to do. It's your call. Um, how do you determine how much venom, how frequently to sting? Do you build up the venom? Um, you know, I, mean, I hear you say we did three stings the first day, six the next, ten the next. And when do you determine that therapy is finished? Uh, I don't. The uh, the uh, people that are bringing them determine that themselves. Uh, I'm a dummy, really. You know, I was probably a year and a half into apnea therapy, and I blurted out one of those prayers. You know, I said, I said, Lord, I said. I don't know a neck bone from an elbow. I said, I don't know anything medicinal. Absolutely nothing. Well, you know, it wasn't 24 to 48 hours and this guy was on the phone and wanted to come out and get stung. And I said, well, come on out. I said, we work on people every Monday, Wednesday, Friday. And he said, well, he said, that's when I'm working on people. He said, how about Sunday? Well, I figured a one-time deal, I said, well, come on out. 
Well, he didn't anymore get out there and he started adjusting people. I mean, he was adjusting them on the kitchen table. He was adjusting them on the floor. He was adjusting them on the coffee table. And I said, Lord, I said, I got to get this guy out of here. I said, uh, my wife had already thrown me out of the house. And uh, so I was, I was stinging people out in the barn. And uh, it wasn't the best of circumstances or anything like that, you know, but uh, uh, so this guy was a 70-year-old uh, heavy weightlifter. And I mean, I watched this guy lift up 2,300 pounds so fast that up and down, that's just a little over a ton, he was lifting this stuff up and down so fast that the noise coming off these manhole covers was just plain deafening. Now, he was a World War II Iwo Jima veteran that got shot up. He was not a strong man. He, he had a two-foot scar coming around these lungs and uh, this weightlifting was one of the things that he used to work himself back from these massive injuries. He had other gunshot wounds too, but uh, uh, he had an ankle, he had a throat, he had gotten one up in here too. Uh, but you know, I absolutely would not want to part with all that that man taught me over six, six and a half year period. Uh, you know, you take an old fart like me, you, you just can't send us back to school, you know. I mean, they'd laugh us out the door. But you know, the Lord still has a way of getting you moved around where he wants you and doing what he wants you to do. And and just just this past year, I had two patients, one in Arkansas and one in West Texas, sent me care packages, you know. I call them homework packages. Uh, books that I had to read and 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 stuff that I had to pick up on and product I had to pick up on. Uh, the one was all on iodine and the other one was all on vitamin C. And vitamin C uh, is one of these awesome, awesome things that uh, uh, what they were doing was they were lapalizing it with a fat and they were using a, a liacin from non-GMO sunflower seeds. And, and when you lapalize it with this fat, it makes it more bioavailable to your body than IV, vitamin C, directly into the veins. So you can do awesome things with it. Um, so I haven't, I've had to start making that stuff. He must have sent me five hundred dollars of stuff, you know, books, and and he sent me a ultrasonic parts cleaner from Harbor Freight. You know, costs around seventy bucks with a twenty percent discount. And you know, this is how. I have been moved and shoved and, uh, to get with the program and some of these other things. Uh, this, is, this is what it looks like. I can make it for about, uh, about 18 cents an ounce. Uh, that's not bad for the quality that you can do. But you know, in the process of doing all this and reading these books, 
there's some pretty eye-opening experiences there. Uh, one of them had a, uh, was out of New, New Zealand, it was telling a story about this guy out of New Zealand that had, he had swine flu, he had hairy cell uh, pneumonia, and he had a cancer too, uh, white cell cancer, something like that. It was three different items that they had. And the, his, his lungs had shut down, and the medical people wanted to pull the plug. And the family would cave in. The family wanted IV vitamin C. So they finally relented and give this guy IV vitamin C. Oh, it wasn't but a couple of days, and the guy was breathing on his own. He turned around that fast. And, and then it, it got on to New Zealand national TV, 60 Minutes, and went around the world. And our famous FDA picked up on it because there was a, uh, one of the slides had a, um, uh, it showed the vitamin C that they were using for this guy. And the FDA come down on the company that was producing this vitamin C and made him take it off the market. Um, these kind of things are a little scary. Uh, and then when you come, get into it deeper yet, and you realize that everything that they're forcing <coughs> our people to get vaccinations, forced vaccinations, before you can get into school, before you can do that, before you can do something else, um, everything that they're forcing you to get these vaccinations for, vitamin C can handle all by itself. How about last year when you heard all this hype going around about this Ebola. You know what Ebola is? It is a massive, massive deficiency of vitamin C. How much of a no-brainer is that? But I mean, is there anybody in the room old enough that can remember the polio epidemics? Thank you. There's a doctor down there in North Carolina that was that had cured, I use the word cured, 60 out of 60 polio victims. And they run this poor doctor in the ground so deep and so far because it was interfering with your iron lungs and your braces and, and up marching times and all this other stuff, you know. But even back then, vitamin C would handle polio. And that don't even scratch the surface of what vitamin C can do. But in this form right here, uh, the ingredients to make, to make this stuff up, I'm using a John Ellis structured water. You can use any kind of distilled water you want. I don't care. Um, the books that the guy sent me run right around 20 bucks out on the internet. I went and bought a hundred or so of each and they, I got them down to twelve dollars. We're not about raping anybody. We're about teaching a man or a woman how to fish. We do not want to give anyone a fish and feed them for a day. We want to teach them how to fish for a lifetime. That's what this vitamin C falls into. I'll continue on here. This here is a, uh, I, it's, it's hard to take a picture of Arthur, you know. Once in a while you can take some good pictures of Arthur where things have straightened out and got movement and flexibility where you couldn't do nothing with a hand or something. But, uh, Bruises are one area where you can get some awesome pictures in 15 minutes. 
and I do mean 15 minutes. And I got a, literally hundreds of pictures of bruises and what they looked like 15 minutes later. Now, oh, here's a story and a half. Um, the gal here on the, this gal right here, she is one of the most powerful voices on epitherapy that I know of in the world. And believe me, she has been through the mill. Uh, and there's no amount of coercing intimidation is going to shut this woman up. I mean, she is a out and out genius. I swear that her mother and father had to have the wisdom of Solomon to keep from stifling that brain when she was a little girl growing up in New York. Uh, she's, she's probably spent damn near three weeks at my place over a couple of visits. And I keep ragging on her. I tell her that we'll leave the out, the, uh, light on at Motel 6 for you anytime you want to make it back. Uh, she's welcome to come back and slum it at Motel 6 anytime she wants to come. But every time she comes, I mean, I'm there picking this brain. I mean, she has got a whole lot to pick up. And, and she shares it. She teaches. Uh, even dummies like me. Uh, She's a Lyme's survivor. She, she spent three quarters of a million dollars on Lyme's with the medical people of her own personal money and had absolutely nothing to show for it except an empty bank account. Uh, she had gone out to California to die. Her body was shutting down. When she got attacked by killer bees out in California. No way. And she was out there walking with this doctor, and when this happened, the doctor took off, and she went down on the ground because she couldn't even hardly shuffle, let alone run, even when killer bees chased her. She covered up her face and said, 